This problem in mathematics is such that if anyone in the mathematical community comes to know that you're solving this problem, then there is something wrong with you. You might be surprised to know that this problem is so simple and easy to understand that a fifth grade would solve it. But as you go into the depth of the problem, then this might turn you into that crazy scientist. This problem has as many names as it has solutions. Commonly, it is known as the Collatz Conjecture. Well, in this video, I will address these two questions. One, what can mathematics currently say about this problem? Two, how's this problem so tough when explaining it is a piece of cake? Hey, this is Theos, and you are watching the cosmological reality where we unravel the inner workings of the universe piece by piece. Pick a number. Now you have to apply only two rules. If the number is odd, then multiply it by three and add one and if it is even then divide it by two. Our number is odd, so we multiply nine by three and add one. We get 28, which is even, so next number is 14. Again, even so, next number is seven, which is odd. The other number is 22. Then 11, 34, 17, 52, 26, 13, 40, 20, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So what's so difficult in this that mathematicians are bumping their heads for more than a decade? 6th July, 1910 marks the birthday of Lothar Kolatz, born in Arnsberg, Westphalia. He is the one known for the above conjecture which is named after himself, the Kolatz conjecture. Okay, so problem with this problem is that, if you start from any number and keep applying the rules given, you always, always end up at one. And once you hit one, the rules of the conjecture will lead you to four, then two, then one. So you are caught in the cycle of 4, 2, 1, and on and on and on. But before you try to find a counterexample for this, let me tell you that over 300 quintillion numbers have been put to the test and not a single one has contradicted the conjecture. But this is not it. The conjecture reveals even more surprising information, one of which is the Benford's Law. This law suggests that in any numerical data, let it be the population of the country or heights of the mountains, or even electricity bills, the first digit will mostly be the number one. In fact, the law provides a specific prediction. About 30% of the time, the first digit will be one, and each subsequent number will appear as the first digit less and less frequently, with nine appearing as the first digit only about 4.6% of the time. This law might seem paradoxical at first glance, because we could naturally assume that in a random set of numbers, each digit from one to nine would have an equal chance of appearing in the leading position, but this is not how it works. This is an intriguing phenomenon that has practical applications, especially in the field of forensic accounting. By analyzing financial datasets, experts can use Benford's law to detect anomalies or potential fraud. If the distribution of leading digits significantly deviates from what Benford's law predicts, it could be a red flag that the data has been artificially manipulated. This law is most effective with data sets that cover a wide range of values, similar to what we knew section five, page one. This law is most effective with data sets that cover a wide range of values, similar to what we see with the three IX plus one sequences. However, it doesn't provide insights into whether every number will eventually fall into the four to one cycle. To find out what's up with this, let me introduce you to the mathematician who dared to confront this problem, Terence Chi-Shen Tao, an Australian mathematician who is the professor of mathematics at the University of California. Tao posted on 8th September 2019 the proof that the conjecture is almost true for almost all the numbers. We do agree that Tao's work isn't the whole answer, yet it's a big step forward into the miles and miles of journey. He said, I wasn't expecting to solve this problem completely, but what I did was more than I expected. In the year 2006, Tao won the Fields Medal, the highest honor in maths, and is regarded one of the best mathematician of his generation. Tao doesn't really spend his time solving impossible problems. It's actually an occupational hazard when you're a mathematician, he said. You could get obsessed with these big famous problems that are way beyond anyone's ability to touch and you can waste a lot of time. Yet he would try his luck for a day or two in a year, solving the most famous problems in maths, 
Over the years, he tried solving the Collatz conjecture, but to his surprise, he got nothing. Then one day, some random person dropped a comment on Tao's blog suggesting he should go for solving the conjecture for almost all numbers instead of cracking the whole thing. And he figured out that the Collatz conjecture kinda reminded him of those partial differential equations, the same kind that popped up in some of his biggest career wins. Partial differential equations, or PDEs for short, are like the math behind some super basic stuff in the universe, such as how a liquid flows, or how gravity waves spread out through space-time. They come into play when you're trying to figure out where something will end up, like guessing where the ripples in a pond will be five seconds after you toss in a stone, based on a mix of different things, like how thick the water is and how fast it's moving. Plus, they're super important in finance, too. For example, the Black Skulls equation uses PDEs to predict how market instruments will behave over time. So, what's the link between the conjecture and PDE? Well, in PDE, when you solve the equation, you input initial condition, values at a starting point, and observe how the system evolves over time. Mathematicians studies whether certain initial conditions lead to finite or infinite values as the system evolves. Tao noticed similarities between the two. They both involve starting values, applying rules, and observing how the solution evolves. The Collatz conjecture asks whether every positive integer eventually reaches 1. Similarly, PDEs asks about the long-term behavior of solutions. Tao recognized that techniques used for studying PDE could potentially shed light on the conjecture. Another way to study the behavior of the conjecture is to use the statistical way of studying lone term behavior of a small number of starting values and extrapolation from there to the long term behavior of all possible values. Let's make this easy to understand. Imagine you're at a pond and you want to understand how the water behaves over time. Instead of examining every single water molecule, which would be impossible, you take a small new section 5, page 2. Instead of examining every single water molecule, which would be impossible, you take a small sample, maybe a cup full of water. You observe how that sample behaves. Does it evaporate, flow, or stay still? Then, you use what you learn from that small sample to make predictions about the entire pond. Now apply this idea to the Collett's conjecture. Start with a bunch of numbers, like a bucket full of integers. Apply the Collett's process to each of them. If almost all of them eventually reach one, or get super close, you might guess that this behavior holds true for all numbers. Of course, Tao's work isn't a complete proof, it doesn't lead us out, but it reveals exciting possibilities. You can get as close as you want to the Collatz conjecture, but it's still out of reach, Tao said. So Tao's recent progress in understanding the Collatz conjecture leaves us both victorious and cautious like catching a slippery fish that wriggles away just when you think you've got it. And yet, despite our advancements and Tao's brilliant insights, the ultimate resolution to the Collatz conjecture slips through our fingers like sand, leaving us yearning for the solid ground of proof we still cannot grasp.